I'm a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome to the interview room, everybody. So grateful to have you here on this wonderful Sunday evening. Hopefully, uh, falling back for your clocks didn't uh, throw you off schedule. Uh, it did for me, uh, but uh, we finally caught it, and we're so grateful that you're here. I had a little technical difficulty a little bit ago, so we apologize for the delay. Uh, we want to thank our subs, our members, and of course our Patreon members, and always our mods who keep things classy, Miss Sophia, Tricia M, Maui Girl, and Mimi J2 over in Hawaii. Uh, or excuse me, Maui Girl over in Hawaii. We're so uh, appreciative of each and every one of you. Uh, tonight, we want to welcome our guests, Dr. Ann Burgess, Dr. Anna Salter, and of course, Dr. Picado, along with our special guest, Jody Pluche. Uh, he, this is a continuation of our victim series, and we wanted to invite Jody here to tell us his story, and I'm going to guarantee you tonight, folks, you are going to be riveted uh, to this man's, not only his story of survival, but just his life. And if you'll notice, he's wearing purple there. That means LSU must be playing uh, Florida uh, coming up here. So let's give a shout out to LSU because he's coming to coming from uh, Louisiana to see us here this evening. So first introductions, as always, uh, my mother would never forgive me if I didn't introduce the good doctors first. Dr. Ann Burgess, PhD, is a renowned pioneer in the assessment and treatment of victims of trauma and abuse. She is the author of Killer by Design, Murderers, Mind Hunters, and My Quest to Decipher the Criminal Mind. She has been a living legend and literally a living legend. Dr. Burgess, it is so great to have you here tonight, Anne. And next to her on the other side of Jody is Dr. Anna Salter. Uh, she's a PhD. Uh, she lectures and consults on sex offenders and victims around the globe, internationally and nationally. She evaluates sex offenders for civil commitment processes, pro proceedings, and other purposes. And she's testified as an expert witness in sexual abuse cases, both civil and criminal. And I'm here to tell you, just Google her name and go watch some of the stuff she's done. Uh, you, your jaw will hit the floor as quickly as mine has in the past. And she's also the author of several books. One of them is called Predators. Now, you got to get all of these books, by the way, that we're going to mention. All the links are going to be below this evening. And, of course, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Bracato, who he studies violent thoughts and actions, emergence in the psychotic and non-psychotic uh, out of people. He is the co-author of the Columbia University Mass Murder Database the largest in the world, and he's the co-author of The New Evil, Understanding the Emergence of Modern Violent Crime. Dr. Bracato also has a private practice in New York City where he sees patients on a daily ba basis, and he also uh, uh, consults as a private forensic services uh, psychologist. So we're so grateful for each and every one of these fine doctors to be here. And of course, now Jody. Jody has worked 
in violent prevention and is a victim service expert in the Victim Service uh, Center of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. He presents professional and college trainings about sexual violence, risk reduction throughout the U U.S., and he's the author of a book about his life, Why Gary Why. And of course, he's got a cat, and we love those cats. We love dogs, and if any of these individuals show up in our stream, we're grateful that they're here as well. If you're not familiar with Jody's story, I'm going to just give you three bullet points of what's going on here. Number one, in March of 1984, Jody, the man in front of you, was abducted by his karate teacher and taken 2,000 miles away from his Baton Rouge, Louisiana home. And he was taken to Los Angeles. The FBI ended up rescuing Jody and his karate teacher uh, at his karate, in the presence of his karate teacher, Jeff Doucette, who was 25 at the time, who was arrested. When they were returning back to Louisiana at the airport, Jody's father, Gary, shot and killed Jeff. In fact, there is a video, it's a famous video, where you see his father on the phone, and as they walk by, his father reaches out and shoots the gentleman. This was on live television. It was on live TV while well, it was going down. I remember it back in 1984. I was a two-year uh, investigator at that time, or policeman at that time. I started my career in 82, and I remember watching that reruns later on that evening in the news. Ultimately, his father was charged with manslaughter and did not serve a day uh, in prison because the judge said prison will do him no good and be no reason to send him there. So with that, we want to welcome all of our guests this evening. And as you come in here tonight, uh, let's be mindful. This is a very sensitive topic, but let's be mindful about picking up and learning something for each and every one of us to help each of us uh, become better people and maybe prevent these types of horrific, violent crimes from ever taking place again with another child. So keep the chat classy. We're so grateful that you're here. So Jody, welcome to the show. And Dr. Burgess, Dr. Salter, and Dr. Picado, thank you guys, each and every one of you for being here this evening. Hey, so Jody, let's let's kick this off, buddy. Um, so tell us tell us your story. Well, what took place? In fifth grade, I started taking karate from a man named Jeff Doucette. Um, he was really, you know, at first we really enjoyed taking the classes, and he had a, what was called a fighting team, and so he had a group of like, you know, seven eight kids that would compete in these tournaments around like New Orleans or we went to Houston. Um, and so after taking karate for a while, he asked if we wanted to join um, the fighting team and we would travel. And then the first tournament I went to in Houston, um, my dad came along with us. I mean, it was Jeff, my dad, me, my two brothers and another family friend and some other kids that we had just met. Um, and it was, I mean, we went to Astroworld after the tournament and it, it was, it, it was fun, you know, this, he was a, a fun guy to be around. Um, unbeknownst to us, he was interested in children. And so he groomed my family and me. He made it seem like he was this excellent guy. I mean, my parents would invite him over on the weekends on like Saturday nights when we were having family over playing, you know, Pictionary, I think it was at the time. Eventually it became Trivial Pursuit, but we'd get together. My, my, I had an aunt and uncle and some cousins that lived in the same neighborhood. And he was invited. He was welcomed. As a matter of fact, my dad actually one time took him to the karate studio on a Sunday because he had spent the night that Saturday night. And um, as he left, because that's where Jeff was living, as my dad left, my dad started crying at the red light. And I was like, what's wrong? And he was like, he's so pitiful. He just he doesn't have anybody. So he turned the car around. He went back to the karate studio. Told, invited Jeff over, brought him to the house, let him shower and gave him a clean shirt. So my dad literally gave him the shirt off his back and brought him to my grandparents' house to eat Sunday dinner. Um, eventually, after Jeff had started uh, victimizing me, 
that that started the grooming started the testing of the boundaries probably started february march of 83 um it really escalated in april and may of 83 and that continued on till he kidnapped me in february of 1984 So um, maybe Dr. Salter, if you if you can maybe guide us here in terms of let, let's talk about testing of the boundaries and, and some of the grooming processes that were, were taking place here, Jody. I mean, walk us through some of the behaviors that were being displayed uh, through through this guy. The first time it entered my consciousness, I was um, he had a. a, a standard car and he was dropping us off after karate practice one day and he's like hey y'all want to drive the car you know i'll you know i'll y'all steer and i'll work the gears and when it was my turn i was driving around the block and he his hand actually just went in my lap just for a second i mean it wasn't long it just and he touched my private parts and i was like whoa does does he know what where his hands are at and i thought okay because it, it was just so instant i thought okay maybe it was just an accident um then it happened again maybe it was left there a little bit longer and i was like okay maybe it's not an accident and then it was it went away that's the first time it entered into my consciousness that he was seeing how i would react but you got to realize i'm in a car i'm driving i'm 10 years old i've got three other kids in the car plus jeff i mean we weren't speeding we were just going around the neighborhood but that was the first time that i kind of was like well maybe it was an accident but looking back I can see setting up to that moment. Um, he would say, "Oh, look, you got to stretch," and you know he'd make sure, "Oh, look, your 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 inner thighs are tight," and that was him kind of normalizing, you know, touching in that area. And then we'd do some stretching, and he would, you know, so it was a gradual thing to where he slowly just kind of worked his way in. I mean, I, they're good at what they do. Mm-hmm. So, so Doctor Salter, but kind of give us an idea from your work and research, get, give us a, a flavor of who this, who these types of guys are in terms of uh, how they start the initial phases uh, to the ultimate end game here. And you're muted, by the way. Yeah, that's fine if you unmute, there you go. Okay. There you go. It's, uh, it's very classic offender behavior, and it serves a couple of purposes. One is to see how the kid reacts. And the second is to desensitize the kid to touch and to keep them thinking it's normal for as long as possible. And the third reason is that when they finally clearly cross a line, the kid often already feels compromised. So the kids, well, for example, one one offender, you know, good Christian, didn't drink, didn't smoke, ran the children's choir, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he would invite kids to go to a ball game and pick one a long way away. And he would never ask the child on, and ask the mother, except when the child was there. So the child is jumping up and down saying, can I go? So then he'd say, well, why doesn't he spend the night with me? Because we're going to have to leave at three in the morning. So the mother would say, okay. And then he would get the kid to his house and he would start wrestling. Well, first he'd say, we can take off our pants because it's just us guys here. So you think of the dilemma the kid's in. If he doesn't want to take off his pants, what's wrong with you? You know, (laughs) there's no women here. Kid would take off his pants, they'd start wrestling. And then... So the kid's desensitized to touch. He's partly bare. His legs are bare, so on and so forth. And then he would start telling dirty jokes. And if the kid understood it, he'd tell a dirty one. The kid didn't understand it. He'd reach out and touch his penis just to explain the the joke. So by the time he abused the kid, how's the kid going to explain to his mother that he was in the room, listening to dirty jokes, wrestling with his pants off. So he already has the kid, where the kid feels uh, compromised. So it mm-hmm. serves several purposes. Okay, so we have to use the word privates. <laughs> that's it's, that's it's, we're good. But okay, so to help us understand some of the social dynamics 
going on around your life at that time, Jody? Mom, dad, well, family dynamics. Well, I was in the sports. At the time we started taking karate, I was playing basketball. And I was actually on like this all-star little, you know, nine, 10 year old basketball team. And the first karate trip, my brothers went on me and my father and my mother, we were in new Orleans playing this basketball tournament. So all we heard were all the fun stories about, you know, they're seeing the black belts fight where they can punch in the face. And uh, they went to Astroworld and my little brother got left at a gas. Speaking of Lake Charles, my little brother got la left at a gas station in Lake Charles and they went, you know, 10 minutes up the road. And they realized that he wasn't in a van. So they had to turn around and go get him. So we're hearing all these fun stories. And, they, and that's why my dad was like, I want to go to the next karate trip too. But I was into sports. I would leave football practice to go to soccer practice. I would leave halftime of a football game to go to my soccer game. I was playing softball, basketball, football. And so I was, I was just into sports. So karate was just another thing like the rest of them. Um, I really wasn't that into karate, but once everything started happening, then Jeff wanted me to quit all the other sports and just to focus on, on being the best karate person. That was so he could have more time with me. Um, but that's what I was like at 10 years old. Mm -hmm. it, did, did you have any, did your, did any of the other kids, were they talking to you, you know, kid to kid or anything about also feeling, you know, the grooming process taking place, but not realizing it? No, they had an older kid, a year older than me, you know, clearly I'm not going to say his name, but he, uh, yeah. he had been victimized by Jeff prior to me but he had aged out and um i'll let one of the doctors explain that term but he had aged out and so jeff had kind of moved on from him to me and he was jealous of me but there was one time where jeff made me and the kid do things in front of jeff oh so he wanted to witness uh, yes interesting. Who'd, who'd like to any comments on that ducks Dr. Burgess, Dr. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, give a couple of other examples. It's amazing how they they develop their their story that goes along with the grooming, and part of it is to also teach them not to show any emotion. Um, I, I one of the cases that I had the 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 boy it was a um, it, where uh, religion was involved and the boy was up there reading something from the a Bible or the gospel or something. And the offense, the offender would go up behind him and was actually uh, touching him while the boy is talking. And it amazed me that this kind of, uh, he had to keep talking. What was he going to do? So that it was kind of a way to silence him as well as to teach them some of the uh, control. Uh, the control of the child was, and then they incorporate that into uh, one of the reasons they don't tell, and they're able not to um, to tell. I remember Ken Lanning always say that he didn't know many boys that would tell unless somebody else had witnessed it, and they would tell on him that it was so hard to get young boys to say anything. I don't know if that was your experience, Jody, but... Um, I know that that's what a lot of, certainly a lot of boys would tell us. I think that the fact that it was the male on male um, time, I and mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, early eighties. Um, I think that that was definitely one of the things that kept me quiet. But another thing that kept me quiet, and I mentioned this in my book is, you know, I knew my dad would kill him if I said anything. So I kept my mouth shut and I didn't say anything. And I think a lot of parents think they're doing good when they tell their kids, like, if anyone ever touches you, you let me know and I'll make sure I'll, I'll get them. Well, what you're doing is you're silencing the child because that now most of the time it's someone known to the child, you know, Uncle Paul, Uncle Bill. And so and the, the child actually and this is another thing that, that I, I would say would kept me quiet. By the time he started doing this, you know, he was this kind of, you know, worshiped or, or admired adult that let us do, you know, fun things. You know, he give us a $10 bill and let us go to the arcade when we were at the mall, he'd take us to the movies. So there's all these rewards that are being gained and all this affection and attention. And, you know, I, I mean, I like the dude. And 
I didn't want him to go to jail. I didn't want him to get hurt. You know, at that, at that point, as a, as a 10, 11 year old. I just want to comment on the term aged out. Um, some offenders have very specific age groups that they are attracted to. It's not true of all of them. Some of them cross age groups, but you will have offenders who are attracted to five-year-old boys or six to 10-year-old girls. And once a kid, especially for offenders who are attracted to prepubescent children, once the child ages out, goes into puberty, they lose their interest in them because they're aroused by very specific physical characteristics like a lack of secondary sex characteristics. And they're turned off once the child becomes pubescent and post-pubescent. Interesting. Dr. Mercado, any thoughts? Well, I think one of the things that Jody was touching on that I think is ex it's, it's extremely important for us to get into is the idea that, that Jody was almost protecting or liked him. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea that he didn't want his father to kill him. The, the idea that, you know, he said, oh, I like the guy. He, you know, he, and, um, and I think we have to touch on this um, because it, it gets to the idea that, you know, like we all think that, that somebody who's being abused would want someone to ride in on a white horse and sort of murder the offender. But I think to really understand the process, we have to get into that confusing state of coming to attach to a person that is abusing you. And um, I know that's something that um, Drs. Burgess and Salter can also touch on a lot um, from their own work. Um, but but Jody, do you want to talk a little bit about that? About and 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 also about how he was taking advantage of what was going on between your parents to kind of come in as a as a listener and a helper uh you know that you could lean on um because i thought it was something pretty awful about using that as a way of getting you to attach to him intentionally and um so i thought you might want to touch on those points a little if you don't well in the summer of 83 he had already been uh, abusing me for several months my my parents separated due to my father's drinking. My my, I, someone goes, well, did your dad have a drinking problem? I said, well, my mother had a problem with it, so I guess that is a drinking problem. But no, my dad drank a lot. He died, I mean, he was a, a a salesman, so he would leave work and he would go uh, go to lunch and he'd have beers there. He'd go to the office to file a report and then he'd go out for happy hour. And so that was kind of like his job. So yeah, he he did drink a lot, um, and so that put a wedge between my parents. Well, all that did was allow Jeff a way to kind of move in and it gave him more, I don't want to say, I guess confidence to where he could try to be like this father figure, but really it was just a way of protecting him. So I wouldn't tell, or even if my mother were to find out, hopefully she wouldn't, you know, tell. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's not uncommon. I don't think that I was the child that was quiet and that's why I was chosen. Um, but, I don't know why I was chosen. I think because I passed his test whenever he was testing my boundaries. And um, there was one incident after uh, we w when it first started, when he first started uh, inappropriately touching me, where we were going to the store. We were at a crawfish boil. And he was like, you don't tell my, your parents what I, I do. And I, I played like I was dumb. I was like, I don't, what are you talking about? Do what? And I th he, he didn't. He stopped right there. I think that's when he knew he had me. But one, okay. one real, quick, real quick thought on that agent out. I saw something somewhere recently. I don't remember where it was, but they said one of the problems that these offenders have is if a child does age out is getting rid of the child so they can move on to somebody younger. And if they do get ratted out, it's because of the, the jealousy from the other child that had already been victimized. Yeah. Dr. Salter, thoughts on that? It is a problem for them. I mean, they're not, they've just told this child, they love the child, they care about the child, you know, he's, all of those things. And then all of a sudden, they're dumping the child, which gives a lie to, to all of that. And, uh, you know, 
it's a, it, it's a real dilemma for them. And it is true that many times uh, th that that's what brings them down is that an older child either gets jealous or they get old enough to realize they've been used and they got summarily dropped at a certain point. But I also want to comment on the issue of likability. The, these guys are likable. You don't get very far as a sex offender if you're not likable, not the grooming type of sex offenders. And they, he could not only get you to like him, he could get the parents to like him. A, a real flaw, I think, in the way we operate as humans is we confuse likability with trustworthiness. And we tend to trust people that we like. We find it, uh, I got a call from a minister recently who has a very troubling individual in his church. And he said the one thing that I thought would make him okay, he said that he, the minister in his church would get through this. He said, I like him, but I don't trust him. And I thought if you can separate those two, then you can deal with this guy. That's, that's interesting. You know, sometimes we forget, you know, that the old terminology of, you know, we're earning trust, right? And what I, I, we've taught, we teach in the Cold Case Foundation to detectives that trust is not earned. Trust is shared. We share trust. And it just seems like these guys are just masters of manipulation to get that sharing process going. I mean, it sounds like early on, Jody, uh, he was, you know, trying to like uh, the karate coach, right? Stretching and all this, but really up here, he was moving in uh, to kind of share some commonalities, i.e. the karate and the stretching, but really his end game was to victimize you. And at that time, how old were you when that, when that first process started when he started to move the very first ten. time 10 years old 10. 10 years old and how old was the other boy that had aged out uh he graduated a year older than me so he would have probably been 11 or 12 i think maybe he was he was very smart so i don't think he would have been held back but he would have been just depending on where our birthdays fall he would have been you know 18 months to a year older than me okay and so uh, how about younger boys or younger kids in the karate cast uh, class? Did you see him uh, trying to groom any of those children? No, I think that was kind of like his form league. That was kind of like his, you know, he had a stable whenever I was to age out. Then, you know, my little brother who looked a lot like me, who was a couple years younger than me, would have probably been on deck. So, I mean, he did have uh, a couple other chilled kids younger than me that I think very possible he may have uh tried something with um but at the time i was his like number one interesting so he was fixated on you right i mean he would have me spend the night at the karate studio with him by myself it wouldn't be uh, any other kids so, i mean the thing that makes me think that he was uh probably had a few other kids is he lived in a karate studio, but there would be times where he would stay at one of the kids' house. You know, you're late, you're tired. He fell asleep on the couch. Um, and I know that he did spend the night at a couple of the other kids that were younger than these houses a few times. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not thinking he's just on his best behavior just because of me. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, go ahead. Yeah, yeah Jody, did he tell you that you were special? Did he um, verbally say anything to you or was it more just behavior with you? Oh, no, that he loved me, that, you know, what we do is special, uh, you know, this is different, you know, things like that to normalize his behavior. Did he say it was okay to do? Would he tell you this is okay to do? Or I, did he not? Say I don't specifically recall that. Um, I do know that because I think he, I, like I said, the, the emotion as far as like, you know, me liking this guy, I don't like, I wasn't, I didn't like what he was doing to me, but that was only for, you know, 15, 20 minutes a day. Whereas the rest of the time we're going to the movies, we're going to the arcade. I mean, 
he was doing everything in his power, you know, going to p for pizza, you know, so everything else was fun. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah. Dr. Salter, anything on what you've just heard from that? No, but I, I did want to ask Jody to, if he, if you could elaborate a little more on the difference in a kid's view who's undergoing those experiences and a parent's view, because often the parents don't understand that dynamic to the point that they feel betrayed. What, why didn't you tell me? You know, you know, I would listen to you. And it actually sets up a conflict or an estrangement between the parent and the child when it comes out later because the child didn't tell. So this, I, I would like for more parents to understand how powerful the affectional bonds can be for the child. The guy may be lying through his teeth and which you would have found out as you've gone into puberty or post puberty and suddenly you weren't important at all anymore. But children's emotions are heartfelt. They're sincere. They're real. When they care about you, they care about you. And that interferes dramatically with being able to report. All right. So whenever I was kidnapped and they arrested Jeff, I went to the police station and I, I had made a decision that I was not going to tell on Jeff. I was going to keep it quiet, deny everything. And then I knew that they were going to take me to the hospital, which they did. They took me to the hospital right after the police station. They did a rape kit. Uh, I hope I can say that. Um, they did a, a complete physical examination and I knew eventually that would come back positive. And that, that report, I was flown home March 1st, 1984. And that report was told to my parents on March 9th, 1984. And I think the best thing that my mother could have done is have Mike Barnett advise her that she needs to remain calm. So my mother where some parents may be like, well, why didn't you tell me I would have, I would have done something. I'd have made it stop. You know, you, you do, you, did you, why didn't you feel comfortable doing this? My mother was told to remain calm. And he also said that Jody probably knows more about intimacy than you do at this point because of what he's been through the last year. And so when, when she confronted me with the evidence that Jeff had essayed me, um, I, I immediately said, yeah, he did. And I, the reason for me doing that and people say, oh, you were trying to protect Jeff. No, no, no. I was not trying to protect Jeff. I was trying to protect Jody because I felt at 11 years old, if I were to tell the cops what had happened, I didn't think Jeff was going to go to jail for the rest of his life. I thought Jeff would go get treatment for six months and would be out. And then he'd come at me saying, well, why did you ratted me out? You did this to me. And so once the hospital report came back positive, then I could tell Jeff, you got yourself caught. It wasn't me who told on you. But my mother remaining calm was very, very important. And I advise any parent, if they've ever, someone discloses or their child discloses some type of abuse to just remain calm. Don't, don't ask why questions. Don't try to make them feel bad. If you would have told me earlier, we could have stopped it a year ago, you know, so just be supportive. Very, very sound, sound advice. Uh, what else would you tell parents uh, and child and children in those dynamics? Well, one of the things that I believe because it, uh, I think it happened to me is I think that with the proper support, okay, so you can go, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a clergyman, whether it's a best friend, whether it's a paid professional, with the proper support, you can work through it. Okay. Uh, can I've got a question here. Can somebody explain the trauma bond? What what exactly is a trauma bond? <laughs> Dr. Salter? Well, I define it as a normal affectional bond, which has been distorted by the dynamics of abuse. It's when someone establishes an affectional bond and then they twist it by hurting the person who cares about them. So the person is then at war between the part of them that likes some parts of this person. This is very typical in incest cases where just like Jody, 
the, the kid just wants it to stop. They don't necessarily want to lose their father. They don't necessarily want the father to go to jail. But in their naivete, they don't realize that it, there may be no other way to stop it. So it's uh, a twisted bond, twisted by the abuse. Not a healthy bond. It certainly wasn't healthy for Jody. But that's the nature of it. You first get the kid to love you, and then you hurt them. And kids will trade almost anything for affection. It's the one thing they cannot live without. So I'd be interested in, in Anne and Gary's uh, definitions also, or, or what do you think about trauma bonds? <clears throat> I, I can weigh in on the, um, sometimes it's called, uh, when we first, when I first with, with my colleagues started looking at it, we called it trauma learning. It's also mm -hmm. something that is learned within the, because it can be very different in different cases. So um, in the treatment, we would, or I would then really work with the young person around what did you learn and let's make sure you understand it so it doesn't get played on another person that you don't incorporate it into your own um, behavior because that can happen um, certainly you can move someone from a victim to the victimizer so we, we um, I, I think it's the same intent between trauma bond and trauma learning but sometimes it's a little bit easier. To, uh, I always felt to talk about trauma learning that you went through this experience for however long it was and all the kinds of things that you did and learned something. And what are you going, what can we help in unlearning? And that they maybe look at it from more of the treatment standpoint. See, that's that, very, yeah. very interesting to me because Jeff was victimized when he was younger as well. And I think his mother mother may have had a hand in that, uh, according to his confession to the police officers on the plane ride home. But at, at some point, you go from being the victim to the victimizer, and that's where I lose the sympathy, I guess, for you. Not you, but for the, the victimizer. Sure. But sure. not necessarily. I think a lot of victims have been afraid to come forward for that reason, because they think everybody's going to see them as a potential victimizer. And it looks like when you have a polygraph backup or you even threaten them with a polygraph, of most offenders were not sexually abused uh, as children. And for sure, most survivors don't uh, abuse anybody. Interesting. Gary, any thoughts on what's been said so far, Dr. Bricano? Uh, quite a number of things passing through my mind, but... Um... One thing I was thinking about is that recently I had been doing some writing on the subject of cults. And what really struck me was that cults are essentially large scale abusive relationships where you're engaging in this kind of trauma bonding on a large scale from the process that is called love bombing. Yes. Where you, you give someone an incredible amount of affection, tell them that what the rest of the world thinks of you is irrelevant. I'm the only one you should listen to. You isolate them. You, and then you start abusing them and forcing them to either commit crimes for you or to engage in in uh, sexual acts that, that are extremely uncomfortable for you. And then there's this process of kind of gaslighting and making a person believe that they can't trust their own mind. And then ultimately, the, the person is in a confused state where they're attached to you, totally dependent on you because they've been isolated. Uh, and um, and they will do anything to to get that that love and affection back from you, and uh, it actually looks an awful lot like an addiction cycle for some of these people too. Um, so that's been very interesting for me. I also I found myself as as Dr. Salter was talking about her point about kindness. I was thinking about the Stephen Sondheim had written that musical Into the Woods, and in there it's it's based very much on the writing of Bettelheim, the Freudian. Uh, the great Freudian analyst, uh, and um, in there, the character of Little Red Riding Hood is essentially presented as a victim of a predator. 
And um, the idea is, is that the wolf is preying upon her and she's sexually aroused at the same time that she's horrified about the idea of being eaten. And then there's a line that says, though scary is exciting, nice is different than good. And I think it gets right to the heart of what it is that the Dr. Salter is explaining about that confusion. And of course, literate writing, which is just a kid, you know, who's being preyed upon by this male figure in a wolf costume, like a, literally a wolf, you know, <laughs> coming along to pray. Now, um, one thing, Jody, that um, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about, and I know from having previously spoken to you, is that, that has always horrified me about this case, among many other things, is that Jeff had, to my knowledge, a previous history of offenses against children. And then apparently when moving to your state, the record was expunged and he was able to work with children and then get it, you know, and then continue these offenses. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. And, and also, am I correct that um, I seem to recall you saying that there was some sense that he might have even been trying to prey on other people you knew uh, around you so that, you know, perhaps this working with children in this karate group was basically to create a pool of victims to draw upon. Uh, and um, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and and also what kind of relationships he might have had in his private life. Like for example, did he have a wife or a significant other or anyone at all? I was always curious about that. So maybe if you could address some of those points. All right, so the first time he asked us to go to the movie, it was a movie called They Call Me Bruce. And my mother had a brother who worked for the sheriff's department. So she called, her brother and said, Hey, can you run a check on this guy? Now I personally believe that he didn't run the check that he forgot, told her, Oh no, he's fine. Yeah. And that was it. But we found out later that he had been arrested before for victimizing a underage child. I don't know. How, I don't know how old the child was, but he, he had a type. Um, so I'm guessing it would be around 10, 10 years old. Um, but he was 17. So it was, I don't know if it was expunged, but it was on his uh. juvenile record. So, it would have shown up in his adult record had that been the case. And they didn't find that out until after he had kidnapped me. Very, very interesting. So but, you, you started young, you know, young. One thing I would love for Dr. Salter, and Dr. Burgess to address is the age at which these men begin to commit these offenses. Uh, we may have different numbers from our respective uh, interviews of people, but I'd love to hear Dr. Salter, and Dr. Burgess address that, how typical it is uh, to begin as a minor yourself, um, victimizing any others. Um, Dr. Salter, Dr. Burgess, do you know? Is that typical? 17? Or quite unusual? I don't know about 17. Uh, Anna, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, I thought you were going to say something about did it, if the abuser had been victimized at a certain age. Did that translate to the age of when oh. he then starts victimizing? Uh, I've certainly seen that. Mm -hmm. And it's like they just get they, they just get fixated on that and, and they can't move beyond it. Uh, I've often wondered because a lot of them seem so they seem younger themselves. I've seen a number of that whether they get so uh, focused on that is that anything, Dr. Salter, you have seen? I don't know about the age 17. That well, the, the research that I've seen, I, and honestly, I can't remember the exact figures, but the it was different for men who abused male children and men who mm -hmm. abused female children. And right. it was an earlier age of onset for men who abused male children. And it was under 15. And now, whether they actually started offending or whether they started um, just being attracted to males, uh, especially this guy sounds like someone who wasn't attracted to anybody else. And, and you have some offenders who are attracted to male children, but they're also attracted to adult females or, or adult males. The, in terms of my clinical experience, the guys who aren't attracted to anybody else when they were coming into puberty and other guys were attracted to 
uh, girls their age or even boys their age, they were attracted to much younger children. That's all they've ever known. And they haven't had any other kinds of attraction. So I think for the, that kind of offender, it, it does start quite young. So this idea about that Jody's talking about that what happened with the record because of his age may actually be fairly common. Well, it is common because adolescent records are sealed. However, I do want to say this. The research is very clear that most adolescent sex offenders do not continue to offend in adulthood. But then again, uh, you know, there's, there's two tap roots for sexual aggression. And one is a deviant arousal pattern where you're attracted to um, sadism or you're attracted to children, you're attracted to something that is not uh, normal. And the other is you're an just antisocial. So you're attracted to your age group or post-pubescence, but y you don't care about their rights or anybody's rights. And the majority of adolescent sex offenders fall into that second group. So I, myself, I think that's why they so seldom act out as adults. I think if you look at this group that's only attracted to uh, uh, children, I, I don't think those figures would be the same in terms of the numbers who reoffend as adults. Very, very interesting. And and so, and, oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Oh, no, yes. go ahead, Gary. Ask, ask well, your question. I'm Don't. sorry, uh, but um, so Jody, one other thing I was curious about is, did Jeff ever show sadistic tendencies? Did did you ever wonder if he would if he would move beyond SA to actually hurting or possibly even killing a person, or did his offenses sort of stop at at sexual offenses and um, yeah. Because, yeah i i think he was just into the sexual offenses i mean there was a point when we were in california where he kind of hinted at maybe uh we could earn some type of money kind of like his mother had done with him and i quickly shot that down i said no not that he wouldn't have done it anyway if he if he got that desperate but i think he was just had the, that attraction i don't right. think he. i mean other than being a karate guy i don't think he was uh you know would have escalated to, to murder or anything like that because I, I remember when we had spoken in the past there were some things that jumped out to suggest that jeff might have had some antisocial traits and uh one of them for example being that as i remember please correct me if i'm wrong but i think i remember that one day he just you know sort of disguised you i think took you off to a hotel room in um california was it with the with the idea being that you were going to go to disney land or something and then was having you write checks <laughs> and you know to uh, remember it was something like having you write checks so that and then um when he basically ran out of money tried to like extort money by calling your parents i mean am i getting the story even basically correct there you're getting you're getting several stories mixed up i guess um, combined okay. I, so correct. before he, before he kidnapped me he would be like hey i need you to write uh sign your mother's name on the back of a check so he'd write he'd write a check to my mother and i'd forge my mother's name and then he'd, he'd be like oh that that forge ain't good enough write it again and so now he's got five checks that i've signed that he could go check cash at any different time when he took me he took me to disneyland he, he when i was taking when i was kidnapped i went to disneyland but he dyed my hair black so i wouldn't be recognized so that was the disguise and yes so there some, there's some sneakiness and trying to be yeah, on sure. the radar and the check writing and the thing. There are some little signs. Oh, he was definitely antisocial personality disorder, sociopath. I mean, they, he definitely fits, checks all the blocks. I had a, a I, I did an interview with a, another friend of mine who kind of did like a, uh, a, an offender analysis on Jeff and he got pretty much it correct. Um, uh, you know, I'll, maybe I can see if I can email it to you. Um, oh, yeah. So you can, read it but yeah he he and he was using like some kind of standard he was asking me would jeff do this would jeff do that and so there's like some kind of and he would be able to tell you what it was but i mean he's using you know different qualifications and different books and this that and the other to come up with his profile but it, it nailed jeff pretty good 
I'm going to guess it, it was like the hair psychopathy checklist or something, but uh, yeah. it, it, it might be that. Yeah. But uh, Chris, uh, sorry. I, uh, I interrupted. No, you're fine. You know, I'm interested in learning about what were the pro what were the behavioral process that, that he put into motion the day he kidnapped you and maybe a week prior to it. What, did you feel it coming? Did you know it was coming? You know, what did he do? How did the, how did that work out? All right. So my dad had put him in touch with a guy named Don Landers who owned several little convenience stores around the Baton Rouge area. It's called Cracker Barrel. It wasn't like the little place you go eat, the old country store you go eat. It was like more like a 7-Eleven or Circle K. And Jeff had came up with this idea to sell these LSU bandanas called Tiger Rags. And he eventually embezzled like 15,000 of Don's money. So Don was coming for his money. And because Jeff had literally stole his money, I think there were going to be uh, possible criminal charges for the right, writing the bad checks or whatever. So Jeff, all this was coming at the same time. So Jeff told me, he said, if I don't get the money, I'm trying to borrow the money. If I don't get it, I'm going to California and I'm taking you with me. And that was the closest I ever came to telling my parents, look, Jeff's been doing this for the past year. And he's going to take me to California. But instead, I just kept my mouth shut. I didn't know specifically the day he came over to the house the morning of Sunday, February 19th and asked my mother if he could borrow the car because his brother had a carpet business and one of the karate students was building a new house and the brother was supposed to be installing the carpet. So Jeff was, and it was only a couple miles away. So my mother was like, sure. And he said, come, come ride with me, Jody. And so my mother was like, you know, don't, don't keep him going all day or something something to that nature. And when we got in the car, instead of going to that house, which was like a couple of miles away, we were heading in a different direction. And I'm like, where are we going? And he's like, we're going to my brother's Mike, Mike's house. I got to get a few things. And then we're going to California. And so we, we went from uh, my house to his brother, Mike's house in Gonzales, Louisiana, drove to Port Arthur, Texas and, and went to his mother's house and the mother lived next door to the sister. And so they called my mother and said, Jeff's here with Jody and they'll be home in the morning. And so that's why my mother was like, okay, what's going on? But she gave him the benefit of the doubt that he was going to be bringing me back Monday morning. When I didn't show up Monday, that's when, or I don't know what it was Monday night. She called Mike Barnett with the sheriff's department. And that Tuesday they were on their way to Port Arthur looking for me, but we had gotten a, a, a bus ticket out of orange, Texas. Um, literally, probably less than an hour before they got there. So we were on a bus heading towards Los Angeles by the time they had gotten there. So was he monitoring communication between obviously your mom and his family because, you know, you're there at that place. What, what uh, shifted his gear to get the bus ticket and get you out of there? That was the plan altogether. The only reason why we didn't go straight, the day of that Sunday is because he had to get the money to get the bus tickets to get us to California. Okay. So we spent that Monday going to his uncle's house in Vinton, Louisiana. That's where his uncle lived. That's I think where Jeff's mom was from. And I think that's where they're all buried. They're buried in Vinton, Louisiana. But uh, once he was able to get a little money to buy the bus tickets, he was telling his mother that he was going to New York and that the bus had to travel through Baton Rouge, had to stop there. And then my mother was going to come pick me up. So she, she didn't know that he was going to California. His mom did not. Did, did he violate you those, the nights he had you completely separated? I want to say there were two nights, but not, not his mother's house. Clearly he couldn't do it on the bus, but once we got to LA, he was able to borrow $550 from a, a karate guy out of Texas. Um, so he got that $550 and he went and got a room at like the downtown Hilton in Los Angeles. I think it was like $85 back then, which is not a good way to spend limited funds. But uh, he did it that night. And then we went out to Canoga Park because he was going to look for a job and an apartment. So we went out to Canoga Park. We took a city bus to Canoga Park. We took a city bus back to the Los Angeles bus station. Then we took a bus from there to Anaheim. And that first night in Anaheim, he, he violated me. And then after that, his mind was somewhere else. He, he, he didn't have, that wasn't his priority. His priority was not getting caught and we were running low on money. And I think he allowed himself to get caught because, you know, he just knew he couldn't keep this up. Well, what night did he uh, change your hair color? I want to say it was right after we 
got to after Disneyland. I think it was after Disneyland because it was in the hotel that he was arrested in. It was a Samoa motel. It now it's called the America's Best Value. My my niece just went there like a couple months ago, and she told me she was like, I got a little emotional just thinking that like you know this is kind of like the family history. But uh, I think he did it after we went to Disneyland, so it would have been our really our first second full day because we would have got to Anaheim that night, went to Disneyland the next day. We checked into Samoa Motel, and he dyed my hair there because they found a um, a wash rag that had like hair brown hair dye because he tried to dye his hair too. And I think, yeah, he tried to dot lighten his hair. So his kind of got a little lighter, but uh, there was a, a wash rag with some brown, you know, material. And they thought that it was a, uh, may have been like something from my body, whereas it was just hair dye. What, I'm sorry for asking so many questions, but my detective mind's going here. What, was he monitoring TV, the TV? Uh, and by this time, had any of the national media, uh, had there been a, a, a bolo put out for you and him or what was going on in that lane? I don't know. I was I was in the room with him. He wasn't. I mean, we were sharing the bed together. So, I mean, I was watching, I think, one day at a time when the police busted in. Um, so it wasn't really monitoring uh, what I was doing. And it wasn't like now where you can you know, let me see your cell phone. Who did you just text? You know, you, it wasn't like that back then. I mean, it, it would have been like, uh, uh, who wrote you that letter or who, or who, who are you going to send that postcard to? But I don't think that he was monitoring anything like that. He was more worried about, you know, I don't know what he's, I don't know what he's worried about. He's more worried about not getting caught, but he was not good at it. Clearly. Right. Yeah. Um, interesting. So you make it, he, you have a day at Disneyland uh, you come back or walk us through that. And then eventually how did he, how'd the capture go down? All right. So we take the bus to Anaheim. We get a room at this one motel. Uh, the next day we get up, we go spend all day at Disneyland. Then we checked into the Samoa motel, which is right around the corner. If you're familiar with Anaheim, Harbor oh, yeah. and Catella, Harbor and Catella is right there. And then Disneyland's on that kind of corner. And so we just kind of walked from Disneyland around that corner, got the first little motel we could and that's where he ended up getting arrested. Well, he was, I think he had paid for one more night at the room and he didn't have any money. And he allowed me to call my mother collect. And they were able to trace, they were able to trace the call through the collect phone call. What was his purpose in having you call your mother? Why did he do that? Does he ask the you first, for money? The first night he just said, okay, call your mother, let her know you're okay. Cause I had gone a week without talking to her. And so, you know, that was the main reason for letting me call. And the, his motivation for calling and telling her to meet him in New York, I don't know what that was about because we weren't in New York. And, and you know, I think that, that was just a ruse to throw her off to make her think or believe that we were in New York when we were really in L.A. Interesting. So it, that is a great that was a great question, Dr. So thank you. I, uh, I appreciate you asking that question. So. The day, so how many days or does he have you at this point from the moment he took you out of Louisiana? I was taken February 19th. And if you look at Jeff's mugshot, and I think this is actually kind of cool. His mugshot is dated February 29th because it was a leap year. So I was okay. going, I was going or, you know, in captive to, you know, captive whatever the word is I'm trying to say, uh, he had me for 10 days and I, I was returned home March 1st. So I was kidnapped February 19th, returned home March 1st. Did you, did, was there any inappropriate media uh, shown to you during those 10 days? No, no, that wasn't, Jeff never really showed me any inappropriate media ever. The only thing that he did, and this was kind of like a running joke with the fighting team, is we would go, when we were at the mall, we'd go to the bookstore, you know, we go to Walden Books and we'd all go to like the magazine section and we'd get like, you know, black belt magazines, karate magazine, karate illustrated. And we'd always get the new person, the new person, and we'd hand them the advocate, the, the gay magazine. And we'd have them looking through it, not knowing really what they were looking through. And then when they get to like some, you know, male body port, male centerfold, then they'd, you know, they'd freak out. And then we'd like, ah, ha, ha, ha. then we'd laugh at them. But that was the only thing that I know of that Jeff did inappropriate with like media. And were there other boys around you that, that we, he would take as a group? As a group, because the, the, 
everyone had been gotten with the the magazine so it when we had a new person to come to the bookstore with us we'd always get them so it was a group thing so it wasn't like we were in some dark you know room and he's trying to get me you know turned on it wasn't like that it was it was more of a joke okay um so any docs any uh thoughts or questions on what i've been asking well real quick while y'all are talking i'm gonna go to the restroom so i'm just gonna you know mute my mic and Turn my cam what's off your, whenever what's I'm your, what what's your cat's name? My cat's name is Lolo. And actually I I rescued her when she was about five to six weeks old. I was driving to Katy, Texas, and it, this was about 30 miles before Lake Charles. And I saw this little baby kitten just walking down the shoulder on the, the interstate. And I, I had to go to the next exit because she was right at the Lacassine exit. So I had to go to the next exit, turn around and come back. And I'm thinking, I'm going to run, I'm going to approach this cat and I'm going to have to watch her get hit by a car because she's going to run from me. But when I called for the little kitty, because I had to run across this field, when I had to, when I started calling for the kitty, she ran right to me. And that's why, that's why she's, you know, she's wanting me to pet her. She's jumping in my lap because she loves me. She knows I saved her. She sleeps on me. She sits on me while I, I watch TV. And I'll tell you a funny story. I used to have this white cat named B Hop, Bernard Hopkins, after my favorite fighter. And B Hop hated the cold, but B Hop hated being inside. And B Hop wasn't allowed inside because he sprayed. He was a male cat. So B Hop didn't like the cold. It was one cold January night. So I brought him in and put him in my room. Well, B Hop slept in the bed with me. And Lolo slept on the next bed over, staring at me, man, all night. And the next day, when I went and put B Hop back outside, she took a dump in my bed. She was like, oh, no. <laughs> She went Amber Heard. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go to the restroom. Y'all chat. I'll be right back. Okay. Well, he well Jody steps away for a moment. Doctor Burgess, you have a funny story about meeting Jody for one of the first times at the White House. Would you share with our sure. audience, and then we'll have him dovetail into that. Sure. We we had uh, there was a conference at the White House that was uh, I think sponsored by National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. And I was, my chair was positioned so that my back was to his back and there was this aisle and he needed to get up. And so as he's getting up, my foot, he, he, he stepped right on my foot. Um, obviously didn't know it was there, whatever. And I think I really yelped a bit because I, I got such a, a, a surprise and that was the way we met which I think is, uh, that was a funny story. Uh, he was one of the speakers, I think. He was there with John Walsh uh, from yeah. um, from the center, yeah. And and he still remembers that story. We Before we yeah. started to, to tonight, everybody, we talked about it briefly. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to say, he remembered it. I didn't remember it. Obviously, it didn't hurt me very much, or I would have remembered it. But that is funny that that uh, so that's been a kind of running joke for quite a few that's years. Cool. That's been a while. Uh, it was, I remember it was in October. Um, I don't know what the what year it was. That's great. Dr. Uh, Salter, Bercato, any thoughts so far on uh, what's what we're discussing? I, I, I have a question for him when he comes back. Well, he he didn't tell because he was afraid that this guy would come after him. But he doesn't feel like he was afraid of him before that moment. So I am I just want him to talk a little about that contradiction because often a grooming offender who, who makes kids love him and all of that, what they're afraid of is disappointing the person, not that the, by telling on them or that they'll get in trouble. They're not afraid of being hurt. So I'm wondering if there was something that led up to that that made him feel that this guy could hurt him. Interesting. Right. Okay, we'll, t we'll make sure we, we get into that. That is, that's a fascinating thought. Uh, Gary, what are your thoughts? Well, one of the things I... I hope we're going to touch on is how incredible it is that this boy when he was a little boy i mean he went to speak at the white house and you know when probably totally traumatized and then went on to appear on national talk shows and become an advocate 
within what 12 to 24 months of when he had been assaulted in this way i mean i always thought that was extraordinary that that he did that i, I oh uh, <laughs> jody i was just saying how how extraordinary it is that you did that advocacy work you know after after all these the, these things happened to you and how you were going on talk shows and it just amazes me you know that that you were able to do that well all right so i've been talk my business partners like we try to turn the book into a documentary series and I have an idea that I haven't even pitched to them yet. But one of the things is, is in uh, 18 years old, I was almost 19 years old, April of 1991, uh, we got a call from the Geraldo Rivera talk show. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we'll fly you up to New York. I even said, hey, can we stay an extra day? Because, you know, we've never been to New York City. And me and my dad were going to try to go to a Yankees game. And so we ended up flying up to New York City. Whole reason why I wanted to do it was a free trip to New York. That was it. Well, it aired in June of 91 and a couple days later i got a phone call from major mike Burnett. i don't know if he was major then but he he uh mike Burnett. he's the guy in the video that yells why gary gary why that my book's named after and uh he said look this is going to be on the news it's going to be in the newspaper but today we arrested this pastor who had been molesting these two boys and one of the boys said that he saw you in geraldo and that's what gave him the courage to speak up and so it was right then and there that I realized that, okay, you know what, I can use this story and I could take something that was negative and turn it to something positive. And you know how you hear people go, you know, if I can just help one person, well, I helped two and I wasn't even trying to on my first shot. So <laughs> that's when I, I realized, okay, you know what, I need to make sure I graduate from college. I need to make sure I go work at some type of victim center, learn as much as I can about it so I could write the book that I wrote. Interesting. Dr. Salter, you have a thought you want to well, ask. I have, a, I have a question, Jody. Um, you describe him as totally loving and don't feel there was anything sadistic uh, going on. But you didn't tell because you're afraid he would come after you. And my experience is that the, the totally grooming guys often have kids who don't tell uh, you know, after he was caught, they don't admit what he did to them because they're afraid of disappointing him or afraid he'll get in trouble. But you thought he had the capacity to come after you. Was there anything in his demeanor that made you afraid, that gave you the feeling that if you betrayed him, he would come after you? Absolutely. All right. So I compare, I compare him to think of like a spousal abuser, like a, a man who beats his wife, or I, I guess we can't say that these days, but a partner beats their other partner. And at first that person's charming and witty and fun to be around on the first date. Oh, you look beautiful. By you know, by the time that, you know, that you've got that emotional connection, that's when they're like, you're not wearing that. You're not leaving the house. You know what? You're not hanging out with her no more. You're going to stay home. You're going to. So I compare him to like an abuser as far as like a spousal abuser, because yeah, he would get mad at me if when my parents were separated, he would get mad at me if I went to the grocery store with my dad. Oh, you love him more than me. You want to spend time. So he was constantly throwing these guilt trips um, constantly. He never really like beat me up, but you know, to, to pop me on the head or something like that to make me feel bad or that he was in control. So he maintained that control over me. Yeah, oh, he absolutely turned. He was like uh, Jekyll and Hyde. So at first he was nice, but then uh, not all the time when he had to be, he would be very controlling. Got it. That makes more sense. Uh, what would you tell, what would you tell um, a family? Not, not, not the victim, but what would you tell a family? What are the red flags that they should catch in retrospect now? To me, the biggest red flag is if someone wants to spend more time with your kid than you do, then that's an issue to me. Um, mm -hmm. If they're trying to isolate your child, hey, come ride with me. Oh, let's go here. I'll bring I'll bring them uh, like uh, mentioned. Oh, well, we're going to go to the baseball game. But you know what? We got to get up early in the morning. Um, yeah. Can he stay with me? Just, you know, that type of thing. Just wanting to just isolate and get your kid alone. So those isolation behaviors should should really be red flags. And what 
And what would be an appropriate way to ask your child about how they may feel while those be, while that's taking place? Does it, does that make sense? Meaning how would to you try approach to, your child? To try to get a disclosure, like, uh, like, or, or trying to protect them. Like, okay, look, uh, uncle Paul wants you to go to the baseball game with him and y'all are going to you know, be in a hotel for two days. Um, if uncle Paul ever does this, ever does that, I, I don't, I don't know the, what exactly to say as far as that, other than I, I would vet who my kids hung out with very carefully or be there. Okay. You know what? Guess what? Jeff didn't molest me that time. Daddy went on the trip with us. That next trip we went to Houston when daddy wasn't there. That's when he violated me for the first time. Okay. So he isolated you from your, from your father and your mother. And that's when he, he took advantage of that and went there uh, you know, so doctor, the question for the docs on the panel, um, if you have a situation, obviously, where the parents are suspecting maybe something is just not, you know, doesn't look right, right? What's an appropriate way to approach a child without, as Jody said early on, you know, not an accusatory, you know, if this happens, that happens. And like, you know, in his case, he was worried that it, his own father would have you know, killed the guy uh, early on. Uh, so what, what is, a, what is, how can we empower parents to, if they have a gut feeling there's something wrong, how do we empower them? What, what, what would be an approach? Well, I, I can tell you, I had a gut feeling one time when my daughter was about 11 years old and uh, this parent of another kid kept showing her all of this attention at a dance and uh it it was just abnormal he was paying more attention to her than he was to his own daughter so uh i said to my i had a nanny at the time and i i said to her look they're going to call and they're going to invite her over and she's not going you know that's how little suspicion i need I said, she's just not going. And she said, oh, what do I say? And I said, well, you can tell them that she's pulling the wings off flies or she's doing quadratic equations. I don't really care, but she's not going. She's never going. Uh, and I contacted the teacher and, and said, I, I don't want this guy alone with my child. I'm not saying anything happened. I'm just saying I'm not comfortable. And she said, oh my goodness. Amazing you should say that. He went on a field trip the other day and he paid so much attention to another child that I thought he was her father and sent a thank you note to the wrong family. So I, let's back up a minute. My, my feeling was if you've got a bad feeling about something, you don't lose a whole lot by getting them to back off. On the other hand, if, if you're wrong, okay, nothing terrible happens. But if you're right, something terrible could happen if you let it go on. So the other thing I say to parents is we're all busy. I'm busy. You're busy. Everybody here is busy. I went to soccer practices. I learned to score baseball. So I had an excuse for hanging around the baseball team. I ended up coaching Little League with two other parents. And the, the funny side of that story to me is that one night we discovered that all three coaches had PhDs and one of them said, it's a wonder these children have won a single game, which I thought was a, good, <laughs> a very good point. But we're handing kids off to other people when we need to be involved. That's the first thing. Because an offender really blew me away one time and he said to me, the parents asked the kids, well, he's not going to tell them. He's going to bring it to me. And when he brings it to me, I'm going to back off. I'm not going to be around him just as much. I'm not going to touch him as, as much. I, anything till that parent's suspicion is down. So I don't have faith that kids are able to disclose on command. They they disclose for a variety of reasons when when the pressure cooker boils over. But I'm I'm not convinced that a question is is definitely is necessarily going to do it. And I think we need to talk prevention 
rather than cleaning up afterwards. And the best way to do that is to be the parent sitting there in the lawn chair with the baseball cap on in practice. Yep. I agree with that philosophy and wisdom a million percent. And, you know, Dr. Ann, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the only thing I would add is that it, I believe it starts early in working mm -hmm. with your child as to just who are you with and, and just show interest in who they're with, regardless of the age. Uh, kids can get into their own with other kids. You got to watch that. Uh, so trying to establish a good working relationship with your child about who they're with, who they're playing with, anything that seems unusual, anything that's use their own language if it's weird or whatever the, the local languages of, of the times. Um, and that will, I think, hold uh, parents in good stead as the child develops over, over the years. Mm -hmm. That's the only other thing I'd say. Yeah. You know, I, I don't uh, talk about this very often, but you know, I'm, I sit on the board of directors for the kinder vision and the greatest save, which is the largest child safety program in the country. It's uh, major league baseball's, um, you know, charity. It's a 501c3, and prevention has been the the key from day one. And you know, we uh, I was honored years ago uh, to do the videos uh, for them. And I was on the if you if you ever had an old Scooby Doo video uh, back in the day, uh, at the end of it was a 30 second promo piece, and I was the spokesperson about giving safety tips. Uh, to children, but you know, with with having you here, Jody. I mean, to to teach us with that authenticity of you know the horror that you've experienced throughout your life, and and now uh, you you turn that into a survivor. Uh, you know, you you took the trauma from victim and you've turned it into a survivor. But I'm curious. Take us to the airport that day. Uh, and walk us through how that all unfolded, folded. All right. So we have to start at the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club was a local restaurant that my dad would go entertain his clients. Uh, my dad used to brag that he got in the last fight at the old Cotton Club and the first fight at the new Cotton Club. And he was very well known by all the owners and bartenders. Um, he also, that just happened to be located probably less than a half a mile from channel two WBRZ TV where my dad had previously worked in college. He had been a cameraman at channel two. He was on their bowling team. He was friends with all of them. <clears throat> so that's why you have the footage of me being returned from new Orleans is my dad knew the people at channel two and they, he told them and they, they drove to new Orleans they, and they got that foot, footage of me coming back and looking at this as a 50 year old when i watch that footage i look like a child that had just been kidnapped and sex uh, been essayed for uh a year i mean i i really i got my hands in my pocket i got a jacket on and i'm not really happy um so the uh the program director his name was bob shadell he said hey gary when are they bringing your boy back talking about jeff and my dad goes oh i think he's back already um and Bob was like, no, he's not back. I think he's coming in tonight. And he got up and he went over to this old payphone booth. They had a payphone booth inside the Cotton Club. And he made the phone call back to Channel 2. And he came back, sat down and said, no, he's coming in. At, I think he'll be in at 9 o'clock tonight. And so my dad had that information. Well, my grandparents came and picked us up because it was a Friday. And we were going out to our camp on False River, which is a lake. And it's just a little small little, you know, one bedroom cabin in the country. But it had like six beds in it and um my grandparents picked us up and we went out there that night and my dad never made it out there well he made it to the quick stop he made he made it to false river he never made it to our camp and that's when he turned around and he went back to the airport with that knowledge and he had the gun in his car and so he went to the airport i think he sat down had a beer um gun was tucked in his boot and if you see the video you can see his right pant leg is up you know because where he was concealing the gun and he saw the cameraman so that's when he 
got on the bank of pay phones across from the pay cameraman. Well, the wall kind of indents a little bit with the, the, there was like 10 to 15 pay phones. The wall kind of indented. And so he saw Mike Barnett by himself. Well, Mike Barnett had decided he was going to go look to see if my dad or any other kids, dads, or maybe Jeff's brother was trying to break him out. So Mike Barnett went and looked for everybody. And if the, the footage starts with Mike going, you know, like, come on. And so as Mike starts walking, you can still see him looking back behind the camera scanning. He told me, he told me this about two years ago. He said there was about 30 to 40 people that had gathered behind the camera thinking, oh, is a celebrity coming? What, you know, what's the news here for? And Mike was like, no, it's just two drunks and a person that violates children. And he said, right when that thought went through his head, he said, that's when that gun went off. He said, he turned around and that's when he yells, you know, why Gary, Gary, why? And he goes and he actually shields my dad from the other police officer, Bud Connor, because Bud's reaching for his gun. I mean, Bud was going to shoot if, if Mike doesn't block my dad bud probably shoots him and my dad figured that's what was going to happen his best friend was actually on the phone with him and what my dad told me is when the lights came on on the camera he knew jeff was coming he couldn't see him because of that indention but then he said he was looking and then when jeff came past that indention he could see out the corner of his glasses and then jeff would disappear from his view and he used the light on the wall to monitor that's why he turns around at the right time, just perfectly and shoots him still on the phone with his best friend shooting underneath his arm. And then he turns around and what is, you know, a, a good man that doesn't deserve prison time. He hangs the phone up. Wow. Where, where were you when this was, going I out? was, I was, uh, at the camp in false river, with my grandparents, and I had fallen asleep and gone to bed early that night. I didn't watch the news. And at that time in my life, I, it wasn't uncommon for me at 11, 10 years, mm, oh, yes, I was almost 12. Okay, so I was 11 for me to watch the news. I mean, because I was in middle school, we had current events that we had to keep up with and that kind of thing. And I probably would have been watching the news that night, but thankfully I didn't. My mother, on the other hand, was at her sister's house and she left early. I guess they were playing dominoes or something. And she left early and came back to the house because she knew Jeff was coming back that night. Well, she's walking around the house, lighting candles, turning on lamps and stuff. And they they promoted the news and the and it went like this because the, the shooting took place about 9 30. everyone says oh it was live on tv it aired live on tv but it wasn't they weren't filming the shooting live and so they teased the news by going unknown assailant guns down alleged kidnapper details at 10. well she knew exactly who that was and so she got upset she started you know screaming crying my neighbors actually heard her and came over um and then they, you know, they took daddy to jail. And the first thing my mother told my dad when she talked to him, she's like, you know, you're going to hell. And he said, I know. I mean, that's just, that's just the mindset he was in. How did you feel when you first heard about it? So the next morning, my grandparents were like, all right, come on, kids, get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. We're like, why? Just get in the car, get in the car. We're going back to that room, get in the car. Well, I'm like, this is weird, you know, but daddy hadn't showed up that night. So we were like, you know, where's daddy? Why didn't daddy come home? Where's daddy? And I knew something was wrong because my, my grandparents demeanor, my initial thought was maybe because, you know, my dad at the time, I don't think they had mad back then, but my dad would he drive himself home after going out and having a few cocktails at the lounge. And I thought maybe he had gotten a DWI or maybe he had gotten in a wreck and got injured from driving drunk, or maybe he injured somebody else. And I wasn't expecting that. Oh, yeah, he went to the airport and, you know, shot Jeff. But my mother sat the four kids down in front of my grandparents front door on the steps and said, you know, last night Jeff came back and daddy shot him. And I think it was like, you know, well, is he dead? And then one of my siblings said, good. I think my sister was like, my daddy's going to jail. And I was upset about hearing that Jeff had been shot. And, uh, well, at the time, I don't think he had been pronounced dead, but his fate was determined. And I was upset because, again, I felt at that time in my life as an 11 year old abuse victim that Jeff was my friend. And so that that's what made me sad. I, I didn't hate daddy. I, I mean, I was probably was mad at daddy because now the world knew what had happened to me. I hadn't disclosed, you know, any type of abuse to anyone at my school. But now they all know. And now you're in sixth grade and all your classmates know that you were violated by an adult male. And that's kind of not the news you want people finding out. And Jody, Dr. how Gary. old were you when you started to understand that what had happened to you was abuse? Uh, 
when I was driving the car and he started testing my boundaries, I knew what he was doing was wrong. I knew that I wasn't to blame. And I think, all right. So in 1981, there was a, a TV special called fallen angel. I actually just watched it on YouTube the other day again. Um, and it's about a guy who does, who takes pictures of children. I, I'm not sure if I can say that, you know, you know, the other word, but, um, and so my parents, my mother, and I watched it with my mother and my father and they sat me and my brothers and sisters. I think my sister probably would have been there too. Um, she wouldn't have really understood, but I know for a fact it was me and my older brother and she watched it. And she's like, you know, there are grownups out there that will do bad things to children. And if anyone ever does something, then you need to come and let me and your father know and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, that's why I understood. So as soon as I was driving that car and he, he touched me inappropriately, I was like, <gasps> he's like one of them people. I think the character the, well, I know the character in the, the, uh, that after special his name was howie a uh, fallen angel his name was howie and so i'm thinking of jeff's like howie and so even though i didn't tell tell i knew to tell i i kept my mouth shut but that's why i never blamed myself or felt you know, like it was my fault because i knew beforehand now um, obviously this isn't something that you have to answer if you're not comfortable but i always wondered how did all of this affect you over the years I mean, did it, you seem obviously to have become a very well adjusted person who's channeled this into extraordinary work. But how, how did it affect you? Well, I have no children. I don't want any children. Um, I don't know if that has to do with what happened to me or not. I, I would probably say if I had to lean one way or the other, say that that's a reason, a part of the reason why. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm single, never married. Um, I identify as, uh, you know, heterosexual. Um, so I don't think it changed me in any way other than, you know, I don't want to get married. I don't want kids. I mean, um, I probably wouldn't have chose the, you know, the, the nonprofit sector to go make no money. Um, back in 2004, this is funny. I was at a Penn state. My, my, my boss and my coworker, they nominated me for the survivor activist of the year for the Pennsylvania commission on crime and delinquency. And I won. And so my parents flew up, we go to Penn state and they, they introduced me. I come up there and I'm in a room with a bunch of social workers, right? You know, a bunch of counselors, social workers. And I said, I, I said, y'all, I would like to thank everybody for you know this award. I said, it's an honor. I was like, you know, when you go into this type of work, I, you don't go into this to get an award. I said, you go, you get into this type of work for the money <laughs> and everybody started laughing. But, uh, you know, that was a nice little trip that my parents, and, and then what was crazy is that was 2004 and now 2011, the biggest news story out there is Penn state covering up, uh, victimizations. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you know, Jody, um, after the last time, we talked um an offender who i still don't understand how he viewed the interview from jail but he did an offender whose name i won't you know give any fame to by giving it here wrote to me and said that he was very interested in me learning from what he had done to groom a child and um and in, in the letter that he wrote me, what he told me was that he thought it was important to make it clear that when he did things like, you know, give a kind of warm welcome to a kid and, and so forth, that it was all fake, that it was totally just a kind of a ruse. And uh, what he explained to me was, for example, he knew that this his who went on to be his victim, um, even of attempted murder, um, was lonely and had parental problems at home and he would leave the light on on the porch and said to the kid i live nearby and you can just pass in front of my house and know that in that place is a warm person that cares about you and you can come in at any time and i'll take care and he after grooming that child wound up fulfilling a long-standing fantasy that he had of taking him out to a field and cutting his throat with a box cutter and uh, dumped him out of the vehicle and the child lived the child lived and um he suspected in other murders um but but the idea is that he meticulously lays out that all of that was fake that it was all a like learning from observing other people how to seem compassionate and to use that 
And um, I thought that was extraordinary. And that letter came as a direct result of the interview that that had been done with you. And um, and I learned a great deal from it. Um, and I wonder what Dr. Burgess and Dr. Salter think about that, about if some of this grooming uh, stuff, if there's any authentic kind of confused kind of, you know, like a, like a person in there who is also a lost person, <laughs> identify, is trying to show kind, or if this is just kind of a false, phony compassion in a person who's just trying to lure a child. I, I think there are two kinds of offenders, and I, I actually do a training on this. And there's the overtly malevolent one who is just fooling the kid. And I've yeah. seen letters like that to kids saying, you know, all those times I went out with you and said I was uh, happy to be with you. I wasn't having a good time. I was just playing you kind of stuff. But I think there's another kind that fools themselves and they go into the, they love children. They, they would never hurt a child, you know, all, all this stuff. So there's one kind that fools us and another kind that fools mm. themselves and us <laughs> at the same time. This, I, I, just a comment on this guy. This, this guy is, was not a deep thinker <laughs> or a good planner. You know, the other duality you see is you see the Jerry Sanduskis of the world who can run a life, be successful in their work, and so forth. And, the, and then you see, and I see this a lot in civil commitment, you see the ones that just can't function in society, that are always in debt, that are always living in somebody else's apartment. And this guy seems like that kind like the, the guy who, who can't make a living, who can't run a, his life, and who is likely to get caught pretty early on because he's such a terrible uh, planner, where, whereas the more sophisticated ones will have runs of 20, 30, 40, 40 years before they're caught. Fascinating. I, well, go ahead. I would agree with that. I mean, because like I said, Jeff was staying at his the karate studio he would stay at his brother's apartment one night he'd stay at those other kids house you know he crashed here every now and then when daddy was here so you know i mean yeah and he and he got caught young so obviously you were 100 correct on that yeah so what a fascinating conversation tonight i've had you for an hour and a half so my my first question is jody will, will you come back and I, I feel like we've made a great friend here this evening and I'd love to learn more about just you and, and help, you know, if you guys, if you don't have his book yet, it's called why Gary, why go and it's going to be in the link below. Um, Dr. Ann's book will be there. Dr. Anna's book will be there. Dr. Bricado's book will be there. It's all going to be below. And I'll tell you, when when they show up, I put them here on my desk behind me, and uh, now I'm going to get yours, <laughs> Gary uh, or Jody. I promise you, I'm going to dive into that. It's a fascinating situation. That's that's always been one of my, you know, as a parent, you know, was that's how I got into police work. I mean, years ago, and it was 1981. And, and Dr. Burgess and Bricado know this story is. My four-year-old son at the time was out riding his big wheel and a car pulled up and the passenger door opened. And fortunately, my youngest, or he's my oldest now, uh, is, you know, he didn't get in the car, but I chased the car, couldn't get the license plate. And I made a deal with God that day. I said, if you give me an opportunity to hunt these guys down, I will do this for the rest of my life. And within... Mm -hmm. A half of a year I was in the police academy being yelled at by some you know crazy people and I figured you know what have I done and uh, but full circle you know I got transferred in 1990 into the homicide unit and we had six we I think it was like six or seven children had been murdered in San Diego County and we had uh, a whole bunch of other situations going on at the time it ended up being uh, a guy that is in Dr. Bricado's research uh, named Porter. Um, he was killing prostitutes and 
But the question was, had the offender changed his victimology? And so I was asked or tapped on to learn about, you know, predatorial behavior in relationship to, you know, this situation. Not as deep as Dr. You know, Salter, obviously, I mean, she's a legend in her in her, uh, herself, and you've got to get her book if you haven't picked it up, those of you listening, Predators, uh, and watch her interviews on YouTube. She's got some fascinating stuff. It, it's pretty heavy. I'll give you guys a heads up, but it's important to understand how these guys are chameleons, which when she you know talks about them even tonight, uh, it's it's important to understand. So, first of all, Jody, thank you so much for coming on. Will you come back at some point? Absolutely. Okay, awesome. And all right, now here's the tradition, right? Final words. You get the last word, and as we start, you know, fading out, you're going to see these, you know, brilliant minds disappear. And you know, the only reason I'm the last one is because. They got to push the buttons at this end, but, <laughs> well, you know, but so we'll start with uh, Dr. Bricado tonight, and then we'll go to Dr. Burgess and then Dr. Salter, and then uh, Jody, you will have the final word. Is that fair enough? Okay. Dr. Bricado. Well, Jody, first of all, oh, what a beauty. Look at the eyes on that and cat. Lola. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I love the story of you rescuing the cat. I, I think it says so much about your character. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, first of all, I just always like to dedicate every single episode that I'm on uh, to the victims. And uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, the person who victimized you is not that important. Right. As Dr. Salter would say, uh, right. Not so important. Uh, this is really, of course, about you and about um, learning how it is to prevent, if it's at all possible, even one more person from experiencing anything uh, like this again. Uh, and um, I just think, you know, the work you do is so important and um, so impressive. And uh, I do hope everybody gets your book. I think it's informative and heartbreaking and frank and um and uh, it, excellent for students, also for those of us who are in the, the forensic world. Uh, and um, so I just want to thank you. And it's such a pleasure to see you again. Feel free to stay in touch. Uh, and um, I'll hand you off. I'm up. Okay. Um, is is Not mine? Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. Not yet. Dr. Burgess uh, and Steve, Dr. Salter. Right. Um, I want to just thank Jody so much for um, sharing his uh, experience with us. I, I use the word experience because I remember one time when the child was thanked for telling their story, the child got very indignant and said, it's not a story. It really happened. So <laughs> I try to watch my words a little bit. But um, it's very important that you were able to do this for many people because I often would hear from people, young people coming forward that they got the courage, if you will, to say something because they watched somebody on TV tell their story. Sometimes it would be, I don't know, uh, in those days, it was be the Oprah Winfrey show or, or, or something like that. I think you said that um, you did go on one of the shows too. And I remember he, Geraldo, I guess it was Geraldo that you said, and we 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 need to remember that's a, the media source or television is very important for young people who might hear. I can remember one child saying, "I was just walking by the door and I just stopped and I was transformed, listening to this person tell what happened to them." So you, it's very very important, I think, what you do, what you've done over over years since all of this happened. Now, the other point I want to make is that kids often say, I didn't know the words to use. I didn't know how to say. I didn't. How do you tell somebody like that uh, what has happened to you? So we need to understand that sometimes the, the experience will come out in a um, kind of in a disguised way or and you have to be tuned into it. That, that's what the child is trying to tell you something. 
and they're, and they're really just trying to find the words. So you've done a wonderful job to help us all understand, and I thank you very much. Great wisdom. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Dr. Salter? Well, I want to say, first of all, uh, that I thank you very much for having me. It's uh, really an honor to be here with colleagues and with people who have done so much in this field. And I certainly include you, Chris, and you, Jody, in that. Uh, and the I guess the last thing I want to say is I want to get back to the concept of survival. There really are a lot of parents whose kids have been harmed, who think they'll never get over it, that they're ruined for life. And uh, offenders, weirdly enough, seem some of them seem to almost take a narcissistic pleasure in that. I know I ruined her for life, right? But... Uh, what I always say is I think of childhood sexual abuse like uh, getting bitten by a rattlesnake. It's not good for anybody, but it, most people do not die from it. They go on. And Jody, uh, one of the things that's so important about you is your matter-of-fact attitude. Because you don't just say this, I got over this. I have a life. I'm, I have a purpose, you know, I am helping. Uh, it's just the manner in which you say it. I think it's obvious that you're, that you're okay. And I really want parents to understand that. It's a horrific experience. It's not good for anybody, but it is certainly something that kids can and do overcome uh, every single day. Uh, so I, I, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, and I hope our paths cross again. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Uh, God bless you, and we appreciate you coming on the show and trusting us uh, to tell your story this evening. Uh, so it's all yours, my friend. I think she took what I was going to say. You, you told me to think about it before we started the, the show. Um, and that was exactly what I was going to say that, you know, it just because you've been through something horrific, it doesn't mean you're, I'm not scarred for life. I'm not damaged goods. I'm not, you know, some, oh, you know, have to act weird in front of me or around me because you don't know what to say. Um, you know, and having spent the last almost two hours here, um, hopefully that that's what you see, you see somebody who's been through something traumatic, who's worked through it, who's gone on and uh, didn't just survive, but went on to make a difference. And so what I'll do when I wrap up, what I'm going to say is I'll end it like I did my book. Um, I was asked to do a presentation, uh, a night of remembrance in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. It was a couple years after 9-11. And the person who had been the keynote speaker before me the year before was the uh, someone at the coroner's office who identified the bodies from the plane crash that crashed out in Somerset County. And they had a brochure and on that brochure, it had a quote from Helen Keller. And I was like, you know what? I am going to use this quote every time I finish a speech and I end my book with it. And it's the world is full of suffering, but it is also full of the overcoming of it. Hard working every day, I'm stressed out 24-7, babe, no, no time outs Wish we could fly away, you and I Go to our favorite place, oh yeah, yeah Make special memories, together I'll be your company, now and forever Facing a
We're taking away, yeah, we're taking away.